All right, Anna, you can take it away. All right, uh, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the 10th uh, symposium, undergraduate research symposium. So happy to have you all here. Um, this is definitely a different way of doing it. I have moderated this now for several years. I'm always really excited to do this. And so I'm especially excited to see in a new format. My name is Anna Schmidt McKenzie. I'm the Director of Residence Life in University Housing. Um, housing is one of the co-sponsors of the symposium. Proud to be so. We think it's a, um, we know it's a big part of a research institution's mission to have research for undergraduates. Um, so thank you, Emily and Harrison, for, for the great work that you're going to present today. Um, the format is such that I'm going to hand it over, hand the reins over to Emily. Um, Lauren, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself as well and kind of your role as a, a second moderator. Sure. So I'm Lauren Goss. I'm the public services librarian in special collections and university archives in the library. And so my primary role in that job is helping people connect with resources. So it's always interesting to hear what people are doing for their research. Um, so I'll be the second moderator, so kind of the tech person, so making sure that you guys can all set up and I'll be monitoring the chat um, for questions and um, yeah, kind of behind the scenes. Cool. And thank you. I, I will need that as a non-techie person myself. Um, so the order that we have it is Emily is going to go first and I'll give you the reins, Emily, to be able to share your screen. Um, we have given the researchers 15 minutes to share the research. Uh, I'll give a, a bit of a heads up when we're getting to the end of that 15 minutes. Um, and then we'll wait till the very end to ask questions. We'll have a Q&A panel for Harrison, Emily, and everyone attending. As Lauren said, if you have questions you want to throw in the chat, um, Lauren, if you wouldn't mind sort of doing that at the very end part, just um, making sure we got all of those questions for our researchers. Um, all right. And with that, um, I would like to first introduce uh, our first presenter, Emily uh, uh, Boshoten um, from Sociology, and her, uh, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and, and uh, introduce your subject. Um, the title of your presentation is Death of Expectations, Understanding Grief Associated with a Disability Diagnosis. And with that, Emily, are you comfortable sharing your screen and taking it away? Yeah, as long as it's cleared for me to share, I am ready. Okay. Perfect. Well, let's minimize that. All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Emily Boshoten. I am a senior undergrad pursuing a degree in sociology, and this is my honors senior thesis. And so the title is the Death of Expectations, Understanding Grief Associated with a Dis Disability Diagnosis. Perfect. So to begin with a little background information, just general to disability, 26% of adults in the US have a disability. And to be more specific to just the population, 20% of US children have special health care conditions. There's no clear way to quantify how many children really have disabilities in the US. So this was my closest statistic. And then for a general social understanding, 31% is the US disability employment rate as of 2019. And this is controlled for working age individuals. And so also to speak on diagnosis, for the purpose of this presentation, the moment of diagnosis is is in reference to when a doctor diagnoses a child with a disability. And so this moment can be the first time parents will learn that their child has a disability or have any inkling. However, some parents whose children are diagnosed post-pregnancy, they will sometimes have an inkling before this moment. And so to begin with a brief literature review to bring us all up to speed, so just a general so sociology term is the idea of deviance, and this was first um, developed by Marx, and it's basically the idea that it, the e equilibrium of an interactive system is disturbed. And so moving into the sick role and the idea of disability, 
So the sick role is when a person has an illness, they step into a new social role. And so being a sick person is viewed as socially deviant because it can go against those interact the interactive systems that take place in our society. And so specific to disability, because disability can sometimes impair a person's ability to work, it's viewed as socially deviant. And so in the sense of medicine, doctors emerge as the gatekeepers to deviance and the embodiment of normalcy because they're able to give treatments and remedies to sometimes combat disabilities or illnesses, but also they have the tools to help children integrate into regular society. And so speaking to the topic of this chat, um, chronic sorrow is a psychology term that was initially developed by Olshansky in 1962, and it refers to the initial shock period for parents post-intellectual disability diagnosis for their child. And so he describes this as the parent's loss of the expectant perfect child, and it's just the experience of the parents, not anyone outside of that. And so my research question was, what shapes parental reactions to a child's disability diagnosis? And specifically, the initial reactions. Because what I wanted to see was what factors, be it from society or wherever they're coming from, are actually influences, influencing a person's reaction to this social role shift, going from their child, which they expect to be a healthy child, to now a child with a disability. So my data and methods, I conducted a content analysis of disability parenting blogs. And so to first, the first step of this process was just finding the blogs. So I went on Google and I just looked up key terms like disability parenting blogs, mommy blogs, that disability, you name it, I tried it. And I was able to locate online clearinghouses, which had lists of up to 40 disability parenting blogs. And once I found these lists, I would then go through each blog with a specific criteria. And that criteria was, first they had to have content about personal experiences. And so this means that I, I ruled out all blogs that had generic parenting tips and just generic information that wasn't personal and didn't pertain to their experience. And they also had to have a functioning website because surprisingly, a lot of clearinghouses don't update regularly. So there are a lot of blogs that you would be, you would read the description in the clearinghouse, like, oh, this sounds great. And then you go to it and it takes you to an error page. And so that definitely limited the number of blogs available. And so once I found an eligible blog, I then looked for the specific posts about the diagnosis experience. So the first step I took was I looked for the about us or our story section of these blogs. And I then, if that wasn't available, I then looked up keywords like diagnosis or doctor in just the search bar, trying to find something resemblance of what I was looking for. And if that didn't work, I then scrolled through all of the posts looking for disability or diagnosis content. And in the end, I was able to find 20 posts which I then analyzed using deduce, and then I looked for trends across the data. And so to just speak generally about the data, I broke it down into the different initial reactions. So from those 20 posts about the dis diagnosis story, 17 of those posts specifically talked about their reactions and how they felt initially after hearing the words, your child has a disability. And so those were broken down into three groups. So the majority of parents had grief, some had relief, and there was one who was very confused, who had a hard time rationalizing what they were hearing. And so to go further, I then focused just on the grief data because I found that a lot of people were discussing intricate details pertaining to the medical aspects of the situation, but also social, future, and it was very complex. And so I took three things away from these grief experiences. The first was my, the main theme of my thesis, which was the death of expectations. And basically parents 
what they explained their grief to be was they explained it as they're grieving the child they're expecting to have throughout the entire pregnancy or throughout the lifetime that had taken place for that child. And they were now coming to terms with the new reality. And so this first quote came from my data and it's a pretty good representation of that concept. The next um, idea was that um, a disability diagnosis has a broad social impact. So we talked about how the psychology term, to how that just pertained to parents. However, I found that this grief went beyond just the parents and actually influenced the entire social network around the parents. So for example, you would have grandparents or friends and family showing up to the hospital. And once the parents told them that their child had Down syndrome, it would just be tears, they would be crying, or they would just get less cards than the other parents in the hospital. And so that was one very big eye-opening thing for me, because I realized that it's not just the parents grieving their children, but it's grieving the life that they're expecting. And it goes beyond just them. And then finally, there was a lot of medical-based confusion. And there was also a lot of information put forward that made the situation seem more daunting than it was. And so parents would describe just being handed manila envelopes full of papers, just chucked full of medical terminology. And they're like, how are we supposed to understand this? How are we supposed to rationalize what's going on if we don't even understand the medical mechanisms happening? And so, I found that that also had a significant impact on the reactions of the parents themselves. One mother whose child was diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, she just noted how she was told the laundry list of all the things her child would never be able to do. And, but in the end, all of these parents explained how at first there was grief, but there was this overwhelming feeling of joy and love towards their child. And that feeling of, I'm going to be okay, and so is my child comes after this initial shock. But I think it's important to understand that this initial shock sheds light onto larger societal trends. And so in conclusion, grief and reactions associated with disability diagnosis encompass a complex social system beyond the child's parents. And so as I spoke to you before, it just the grief and the reactions and the experiences of a diagnosis process isn't just this individualized system, but a complex one. Also, healthcare professionals have an influential role in the initial diagnosis experience, and that, that role really influences the parents' reaction and then how they share that information with their families and friends. So in the future, medical training should put a greater emphasis on diagnosis delivery training. And I think that there should also be a way to help explain the medical terminology to parents. And also new media guidelines should be developed to portray disability in an honest and positive light because clearly lar large social systems are not understanding the reality of a di disability diagnosis or a disability identity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. I was about to say you have five minutes, but you wrapped it on up. So um, yeah. we're going to uh, uh, say thank you. And uh, we're going to hold all of the questions. If you joined us late, we're going to hold all the questions um, until the very end. Um, and uh, for all of our researchers, um, and I have a quick change in the schedule. Um, we have uh, Nolan Kriska with us. Um, who is going to be the next presenter and should be able to share your screen, Nolan, and I'll give you the reins um, in a moment. Um, but Nolan is gonna be presenting his presentation on uh, titled, Treat Your Anxiety and, where did my chat go? Uh, I can explain it if that helps. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Sorry, the, the chat was moving around for me, Nolan. So I'm going to to be more productive with evidence based methods. So I'm going to turn it over to you uh, and I'll give you a five minute warning in the chat. Um, uh, 
when we when we get to about 10 minutes. And with that, I will hand it over to Nolan. Awesome. Uh, well, I'm going to be presenting phase one of a curriculum I'd like to develop. And before I get started, I'd like to apologize for not being able to stick around for questions. Um, but please feel free to email me or uh, text me at a phone number that I'll put into the chat. So uh, this curriculum focuses on uh, controlling and treating anxiety uh, with psychotherapy. And it's primarily informed by the Northwest in uh, Anxiety Institute and supported by the Honors College and Professor Dara Baldwin. So special thanks to them. So the most important piece uh, and the most important takeaway from this presentation is to understand um, at a personal level that anxiety is something that you can get used to. It's something that you can grow through. And it's all about how you um, practice it when you experience it. So to grow through anxiety, we use habituation method, which kind of parallels uh, jumping into a cold pool of water. It's uncomfortable at first, but over time, it's you get used to the temperature. And in that same sense, uh, we practice these psychotherapy methods until they become a habit. And with that, I will now show you an example of what anxiety looks like if you have unhealthy habits, like the habits that I used to practice. So what happens is you feel comfortable and then you get these sharp rises um, through rumination or uh, environment like uh the previous presenter was saying sorry i can't see your name and um sometimes it just happens randomly and then we engage in safety behaviors to bring it down quickly and these behaviors include reassurance uh problem solving uh needing validation from people so we see these high points and the problem is uh you never really feel the extent of your anxiety because you're caught in this loop and by not feeling it by avoiding it uh, you allow it to persist in a negative way in a way that makes you feel trapped or burdened or less productive and to fix this uh, what you would like to do is hold on to anxiety at those peaks and allow yourself to feel it and know that you'll be okay because it's anxiety's perceived danger and that peak will keep going and it'll rise, but at some point, at some time, it's gonna come down. So this is the habituation method. And we see that the more times you practice the habituation method, the lower the uh, curve goes because you've been there before, you've felt that, you've seen how your body responds. And, uh, The, the problem is some people don't allow themselves to, to reach this, this peak because it's an overwhelming state like a panic attack. But to really grasp anxiety, that, that next level step is to feel that panic attack and be okay with doing whatever you want like during it. So uh, with that said, anxiety uh, health is not a direct linear line. Uh, it goes up, it goes down, but you're always going in the same direction. So if you feel like you're relapsing in some way, just know that that's one step off the path headed in the same direction. And you're always pushing in that direction and that's what matters most. So to understand what we can change, uh, specifically in the habituation method, we use cognitive behavioral therapy. And we change our thoughts and behaviors, not our feelings, because those are inherent and harder to uh, push. And it leads to things like avoidance. So uh, thought is how we understand our feelings and our behaviors. And it's how we imbue meaning into um, ourselves, our actions, our feelings. And then behavior, is our actions in response to thoughts or feelings like uh, needing to go on a walk to clear your head and then 
relying on that every time um, before you take a test. And it's kind of that same safety behavior where you get kind of loop. Now, all of this is used to help with feelings, which include emotion and physiological. So emotions are sadness, fear, anxiety, happiness, and they come out of us in, in very interesting ways. Um, and then physiological is uh, physical sensations that uh, can include vertigo, um, tingling in the skin, uh, heart palpitations, sweating. And the point is in cognitive behavioral therapy to feel these and not think of them as something that you need to change, but accept. Accept the uncertainty, accept the vulnerability, and you'll see growth, a lot of growth. So uh, the application of uh, the habituation method is the inhibitory learning model. This is a list of one to 10 um, concerned with things that can cause anxiety. And to make this relevant to you, you wanna stay focused on a theme. So the theme I chose was isolation. You can have 20 different lists, but the point is to start with one. So on a level one is something that doesn't cause anxiety. This is uh, thinking of somebody being in a closet. It's a tight space, it's uncomfortable, but it's not you and it's no danger. It's easy. A 10 is more of a risk in your head that could lead to a panic attack or a dark place, um, you, maybe uh, detachment or depression-like symptoms. Um, and the example I gave was having your friend lock you in their trunk, giving them your cell phone and asking them to come back between five and 20 minutes. So there's uncertainty in time, it's a new environment and you have no safety. And the point of this is not to start with a 10. The point is to start with a four, a five, a six, and to see what you can do with that. See how you can overcome it. And the more times you overcome it, the first time, the fifth, the 10th, that five will turn to a four. It'll turn into a three. And the best part of this model is that in my experience, uh, the tens also at the same time turn into a nine because anxiety is the same in your body. And it, re like it's, it can be understood at a five level as much as a 10 level. And so once that 10 becomes a seven and you conquer it, what else you can do? Like there's no stopping your growth because you've been there before and you can do it. So a uh, side note to this is you don't want to go outside or inside the donut because um, putting inhibitory learning model numbers in or out makes it ineffective. So outside of the donut are risky behaviors like um, not telling your friend to come back and get you when you're locked in the car, which would not be helpful at all. That would just cause a bad situation. You want to plan out these uh, practices. But the same can be said for uh, safety. If there's no threat um, and you're operating at a one and you say it's a seven, um, you're not going to see the growth that you want. So you want to stay in the middle and that requires some bravery, that requires some honesty, some vulnerability, and it leads to growth. So if you do have a hard time in one of these moments and you have a panic attack or you're completely overwhelmed in a situation, a great thing to use is um, objectiveness and existential thought. So one of my favorites is thinking of uh, your intrusive thoughts as uh, leaves in a stream. W one may be red, one may be beautiful, one may be thorny, uh, but it's up to you to whether or not you pick it up and stare at it and put it on you and pretend like it's a part of you. You could do that or you could let it float down that river just like every other thought you've ever had. Um, another one that I really like is the snow globe interpretation. So 
uh, once again, intrusive thought is like a single snowflake um, and it can be manageable. It's right there. But when you have 10, 20, 40 intrusive thoughts whirling around your head at the same time, it can definitely feel completely overwhelming. But the thing that you have to remember is that in the long term, it'll settle. It always settles every time. And when you're in those whirlwind situations, you just need to understand that this is growth and this is a time where you wait for it to settle. And the final, uh, actually I'm running out of time, so I'll skip the last one. Uh, but uh, the main takeaways of my presentation are um, know that these uh, that the inhibitory learning model applies to you. If anxiety stops you from being productive and doing work, like I need to watch TV because I have too much to do and I need a break. That's anxiety telling you to take a back seat and you don't need to do that. And in that same sense, uh, disorders like OCD, social and general anxiety disorder, bipolar disorder, PTSD, addiction and hoarding all operate in uh, need to act because of a fear of uh, the anxiety inside of you. And that fear doesn't need to be there and you can do things right now uh, to help yourself. Um, my second takeaway is just to practice the inhibitory learning model like uh, you're preparing for a marathon. You can't just think about how well you're going to do on your marathon. You need to put in the time, put in the effort, and you will see the results. Um, just like you'll see the results with anxiety if you practice the inhibitory learning model. So 10, 20 minutes a day, every day, for as long as it takes, that's lovely. And then the final takeaway is uh, to use the existential thoughts uh, like the leaf in the river to practice diffusion if you have like a panic attack or are very stressed in a situation. Um, you can make it manageable. You can make it through it. So thank you for your time. Uh, that's about it. If you have any questions um, or I don't want to go off track, but. That's okay. I know you have a, a couple of minutes, Nolan. I don't know if there's any, because you have to leave and are not going to be here at the end, if there's any immediate questions. And I can be here over two o'clock. I just wanted to leave a little time if that's um, helpful to anybody. So we've got a couple minutes if anyone has a question for Nolan to type it in the chat. chat. Um, I don't see anyone to the everyone, but I don't know, Nolan, if you see anyone, any questions to you privately or, or, or not. Uh, I do not. You can also uh, speak them if that's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but oh, here we go. I got one. It says, you hope to use this as a curriculum for others. How do you plan to implement that? Interesting question, Isabel. Um, I plan to make this free. I have a coder friend who is going to make a curriculum kind of like your intro level econ classes or psychology or uh, whatever you know that requires uh, like click and drags for grades. Um, so he's, he's going to program that. And then over the summer, I'm working with another friend who's an uh, entrepreneur. And we're going to try to um, get more people involved and see what spaces we're actually applicable in because uh, this information's out there, but it's kind of not digestible. And I think the goal of this is to make it digestible for everybody. So that's my goal. And then phase two, three, and four is that development. Yeah. Great, Nolan. Thank you so much for your great work. Good luck with your, your next class. And um, we'll, we'll see you later. Um, 
and thank you very much again. Um, thank you. Up, Appreciate your time. Yeah, of course. Um, next up, we have Harrison Jensen. Um, and let me pull up your presentation here. Or if you, I have, I've turned it over to you, if you have your, um, are you able to share your screen? Yeah. Okay, awesome. So Harrison, um, as you can see, is going to be presenting to us uh, the procedure barrier, procedural barriers to healthcare applying for coverage through the Oregon Health Plan or applying for Medicaid in Oregon, which is what the Oregon Health Plan is called here. Um, so uh, Harrison, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. And the same deal, I'll give you a five minute warning with the chat. Um, and then we'll, we'll do a full Q&A for uh, both Emily and Harrison. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Thanks. So like you said, my name is Harrison Jensen, and I'm going to be presenting on barriers to applying for Medicaid in Oregon. This is my undergraduate thesis for the School of Planning, Public Policy and Management. Uh, before I get into my research, I want to give a brief overview of the health insurance system in the United States. 49% uh, or close to a majority of Americans receive health insurance through their employer. By comparison, Around 35% or so of Americans receive insurance through the government through programs like Medicare and Medicaid. Now, the federal government plays less of a role in the provision of health insurance in the United States than the central governments in other developed countries do. And this is partly because employer-sponsored insurance or insurance paid for partly by your, by your employer, excuse me, has been the predominant form of insurance for well over a century and interest groups, organized labor, and medical professionals have lobbied to keep it that way for quite some time. Now, as long as this system has been around for, and as well as it works for people that have a job, it doesn't work well for other people. Uh, Medicaid and Medicare were created to uh, extend insurance coverage to those that were left in the lurch by employer-sponsored insurance. Medicare is a public health insurance program for senior 65 and older, and Medicaid for low-income Americans and the disabled. So a bit more about Medicaid. Medicaid is a means-tested program. So that is, eligibility for Medicaid is determined based on your income. Uh, so if you make a certain percentage of the federal poverty level, which is a measure that the government uses to approximate poverty, uh, then you may or may not be eligible to enroll. Now the federal poverty level up to which you're eligible for Medicaid varies by state. In Oregon, if I remember correctly, it's 132% of the federal poverty level. Um, again, that varies by state. If you make up to 132% of the federal poverty level in Oregon, you may not be eligible in other states. Uh, it's jointly administered by the states and the federal government. So the federal government sets broad guidelines for what sorts of groups the states have to cover, which is pregnant women and children, and uh, what sorts of benefits the states have to cover, including inpatient and outpatient hospital care. And it's within these guidelines that the states have a lot of flexibility to determine what other benefits and uh, groups they cover. So why does Medicaid matter? Well, Medicaid matters because healthcare is very, very expensive for a lot of people, but it's particularly expensive for low-income people and disadvantaged people for whom the cost of healthcare is a larger, is a higher proportion of their income. Now, were it not for Medicaid, many, many low-income people would not be able to afford health care, would either have to take on crippling medical debt or have to forego necessary medical care and risk uh, illness, injury, or even death. Now, not only does Medicaid alleviate financial stress for low-income individuals, it also increases access to and use of care. There's been research that shows that having Medicaid is positively associated with having a regular source of primary care, as well as other indicators of health. So given the benefits of being enrolled in Medicaid, if you were eligible, the decision to enroll would seem to be an easy and obvious one. However, the nationwide Medicaid participation rate or take-up rate, so that's the ratio of those eligible for Medicaid, or those enrolled in Medicaid, excuse me, to those eligible for Medicaid, for parents is 71.7%. So that means that 30% of eligible parents 
in the United States are not enrolled in Medicaid. Why is this? There's actually, there hasn't been a lot of research done on the phenomena of low Medicaid participation, but what research there has been has suggested three main reasons. And the first of these is stigma. Now, Medicaid is not technically a welfare program, but it's often lumped in with programs that are. And welfare has a sort of a negative reputation in this country, partly because of um, this image that's been played up over the past 30 or 40 years, that people that are enrolled in Medicaid pro or in welfare programs, excuse me, are taking advantage of the government or defrauding the government. Now, the instance of welfare fraud is actually very, very low, but this image is stuck. And it's possible that people choose not to enroll in Medicaid because they don't want to be seen as dependent on or taking advantage of the government and of uh, taxpayer dollars. Now, even so, I don't think that this completely explains why so many people choose not to enroll in Medicaid. Now, there are two other reasons presented in the research, and these are informational barriers and procedural barriers. Now, informational barriers are barriers related to uh, awareness or knowledge of Medicaid. These are particularly a problem for limited English proficient, so people that can't speak English proficiently, and less literate or illiterate Americans who are much more likely to live in poverty and must be eligible for Medicaid than people that can speak and read English proficiently. They face barriers related to know-how, that is knowing about Medicaid, knowing how to apply for Medicaid, knowing what Medicaid does or does not cover. And then there's procedural barriers. Uh, these are barriers in the process of applying for Medicaid. I put simply, the more complicated the application process for Medicaid, the less likely people are to enroll. And again, this is particularly true for the sorts of people that would be applying for Medicaid or are mostly low income working people who have a lot to worry about and don't necessarily have as much time or energy to devote to a long involved application process. So again, these reasons have been hypothesized. There hasn't been a lot of research done on the extent to which uh, they actually explain low take up. So what I wanted to find out was if there are in fact barriers in the application process for OHP Ordinance Medicaid program, and if there are, what kind of barriers are they? Are they mostly informational, procedural? Is it a mix of both? Now, what I found in interviewing nine applicants for the Ordinance Health Plan is that there were in fact informational and procedural barriers. Now, I should preface with a bit about the sample. So I collected demographic information from the applicants to compare against the demographic makeup of the population covered by the Oregon Health Plan, assuming that people applying for, or who would apply for OHP are demographically similar to those enrolled in the program. And what I found was that the sample was not reflective of the demographic makeup of the population covered by OHP. As you can see here, 77% of the applicants I interviewed were under the age of 26, 77% were female and 100% or white, as compared to 59% of those enrolled in OHP under the age of 26, 56% uh, female and 63% white. So strong inferences about the population covered by OHP or OHP or would be applicants for OHP can't really be made from my sample. Now, additionally, all applicants had some post-secondary education and spoke English. Well, even so, there are some interesting insights uh, that I found from my research. Now, I had anticipated that procedural barriers would, would be the barriers that applicants would have encountered, encountered most frequently in the process of applying. I figured since the applicants were well-educated for the most part and could speak and read English proficiently, that they wouldn't face the same barriers to obtaining and understanding information about Medicaid as a uh, less educated sample. However, that wasn't the case. In fact, None of the applicants I talked to really had uh, a high level of knowledge about OHP before they applied. All nine said that they had known little to nothing about the program before they had applied. Now, six of the nine said that they knew a bit about the program, mostly that it was uh, a government program that covered low-income people but couldn't name specifics about OHP. And three of the nine said that they didn't even know that the program existed before they had applied. They had no idea that OHP existed. And again, I found this surprising considering that these were applicants that should have known about OHP given that they were well-educated and spoke English proficiently. 
Now, they also noted procedural barriers. Uh, and these were um, a lack of clarity in the instructions for the applications. So applicants weren't entirely sure how much documentation of income they had to provide in the application process. And this makes sense considering the applicants didn't know a lot about OHP before they applied. Um, another part of the application process that applicants uh, cited difficulty with was completion of different parts of the application online and on paper. Now, the Affordable Care Act mandated that states allow applicants for Medicaid to apply both in person, online, and by mail. Now, most of the applicants I talked to were either working part or full time or enrolled in a post secondary institution, part or full time, or working in and school when they applied, so they didn't really have the time to make it into a social, ser social services office, excuse me, to apply in person. So most of them opted instead to apply online out of convenience. Now, due to uh, difficulty with the online portal, uh, many of the applicants ended up completing parts of the application on paper, which they remarked was frustrating because they had started the application online as they had figured it would be more convenient. And uh, the other procedural barriers the applicant cited was the OHP customer service phone line. Now, applicants um, were generally satisfied with the quality of the service they received through the phone line, but everyone I talked to that called the customer service phone line had to wait between 15 minutes to sometimes over an hour to talk to somebody. Now, again, if you are working part or full time or you're in school during the hours that the phone line is operational, you don't really have that time to wait around. So really the main takeaway from my research is that a lot of people don't know about Medicaid. Um, again, even considering the, um, the limitations that uh, I had with the demographic makeup of the sample, um, it's surprising that people that should be more uh, knowledgeable about Medicaid just didn't even know that it existed. Now, this suggests that policymakers need to uh, invest more in outreach, reaching people that are eligible for Medicaid uh, to make sure that they're not only aware of Medicaid, but know how to enroll. And I think that this is sort of a, a played out phrase, but it's, this is more important now than ever as many people are losing their employer-sponsored insurance and um, many more people will be enrolling in Medicaid. And if these people don't know about Medicaid, then it's entirely likely that they may forego care or um, incur serious medical debt because they can't afford health care. That's it. Well, thank you so much, Harrison. Thanks. Uh, great job to, to all three of our presenters. Uh, I know it's a talked about anxiety during one of the sessions, but this is an anxiety producing uh, experience often for presenters and you all did a really wonderful job. Um, so big kudos to, to all three of you. Um, I will open the floor now to um, all of our, our folks um, in, the, in the room and that are watching all of our audience. Uh, if there are questions, I think if you want to go ahead and just unmute yourself and we can just do this verbally or if you feel more comfortable we can you know do it in the chat but either way um, I can I can kick off the questions uh, Harrison Emily um, the same question for both of you might be how did you get interested in your particular um, uh, research area in question. And Emily, I'll start with you if that's okay. Since yeah. You first. <laughs> so I've had a disability since I was 15. And that's not really like my experience didn't really influence my topic. However, I was on one of those, like in one of those YouTube polls, you mm -hmm. just find random information. And I found these parenting blogs about their experience with their child being diagnosed with a disability. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So it kind of sparked from there. And what about you, Harrison? So I got interested through my dad, who's an ER doctor. Um, you know, in, in shadowing him a couple of times, I, I sort of got interested in healthcare. I'm a little bit too squeamish mm -hmm. for the, um, the, the doctor side of things, but 
I thought that uh, paying for healthcare was something that interested me. Um, quality and access to healthcare was something that was interested in me and that sort of set me on the path that I'm on now. I was also curious if you think, I mean, healthcare and politics sometimes intertwine. Um, and when you talked about policymakers, um, not to be a pessimist, but do you sometimes think these procedural barriers are put into place um, in, in any effort to kind of not raise the level of uh, participation? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that um, well, a lot of the barriers, a lot of barriers that applicants encounter in Medicaid are just uh, related to bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe not created intentionally, but there absolutely are barriers mm -hmm. um, to enrolling in Medicaid that policymakers um, create intentionally to keep people out mm -hmm. of Medicaid. I mean, and partly that's because that uh, because Medicaid is expensive. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the largest state expenditures, I think, for all states. Um, so the fewer people that are enrolled in Medicaid, the less expensive it is for a state to manage its Medicaid program. Um, but, I mean, those arguments don't really hold up under a lot of scrutiny because the federal government pays most of the state's Medicaid expenditures anyway. Um, I think that there's been this long-standing opposition to uh, programs like Medicaid or so-called welfare programs um, in this country. And I, I can't really explain why I think that's for a political scientist to mm -hmm. sort of suss out, but um, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question from the audience in my chat. Um, uh, in your research, sorry, that was your timer for the end. So we're there. <laughs> um, in your research, Harrison, did you find examples of successful outreach strategies for increasing knowledge or enrollment about Medicaid? Yeah, I did. I found a couple. So uh, two examples that I cite in my thesis uh, were outreach initiatives in Michigan and Utah where they embedded enrollment specialists or recruited healthcare workers to enroll people in Medicaid at the point of service. Uh, this is the best way uh, to reach people that are eligible to enroll in Medicaid um, because they're there in the building. I mean, a barrier for a lot of people who uh, are eligible for Medicaid is that they don't have a stable address or aren't able to um, access the internet or make it into a social services office. So reaching them at the point of service has been shown to be uh, very, very effective. Um, I'm not sure if these have really been explored seriously by either state. They were pilot initiatives. So I'm not sure what the um, what the outcome of those have been. But yeah, those were, were very successful. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, uh, I have a, another question from the audience, but this one is for Emily. Um, did you find that there were differences in the, um, uh, in the depth of expectations by the kind or type of disability that the child had? That was the interesting thing is that it was pretty even throughout. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of the posts didn't they didn't understand why they had were upset or in this grieving phase. Mm -hmm. However, there were posts where they explicitly stated that they're grieving the life that they were expecting, mm -hmm. and so it was interesting. Once I found that trend, looking back at all the other grief posts and finding similar nuances throughout. However, it was evenly spread throughout all the data that had grief. Um, Emily, as a follow-up to that, um, is there any impact that you know of or research on the impact of that grief on the child later in life of, um, like, I'm thinking a little similarly around um, when a child comes out, um, either as transgender or gay, that there is sometimes a, a grief that the parent has of what they expected their child's life to be. Um, and an adjustment. Now that's a later in life. So the child is, you know, usually um, typically is, is, is older and, and experiences that grief. But I wasn't sure if um, there's any impact on the, on the child themselves that you know of. Well, I personally don't know for literature standpoint. However, from the data that I collected, 
it was able to see that some parents, they were really stalled on this grief aspect. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't fully, it, it really depended on the beliefs of the parents toward medicine. Mm -hmm. And so if parents fully bought into what the doctors were telling them, then they mm -hmm. would completely go into this mode of therapies, medicines, and buy into the idea. However, you have families who are more religious where they would just start praying profusely and mm -hmm. trying to have God guide them through this. Mm -hmm. However, the grief, I found that overall it went away. It was just mm -hmm. an initial reaction. However, it would be interesting to look at a longitudinal study in the future mm -hmm. and see what happens. Are there any qu other questions from our, our audience? Any musings, statements? <laughs> Any questions that you have of each other, Harrison and Emily? And none that I can think of. Yeah, no, your presentation was very thorough, so. Thanks, appreciate it, yours was too. Thanks. All right. Um, well, uh, Crystal said, a wonderful job to you both. And um, I echo that. And on behalf of the uh, Undergraduate Symposium, the Center for Undergraduate Research, uh, and engagement on housing and myself just wanted to say thanks for participating uh, today, both as uh, audience supporters um, and uh, as researchers. Uh, I know you all both have amazing careers ahead of you. Thanks for contributing to uh, creating knowledge. Uh, it's really an important part of the academy. So um, you all have a great rest of your term and afternoon and we'll see you later. Thank you guys. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Emily.